you. It's um, it's really um, a pleasure to be here. It's, it's it's a pleasure to be back to EYP. That's that's absolutely fantastic. Um, as such a uh, such a great uh, as such a great organization, such a great crowd. So it's really uh, really fantastic to be here, and. Um, it's my honor to moderate um, tonight's um, panel. We'll be speaking about um, um, yeah, countries that we call often post-Soviet. Post we want, want to understand what does that actually mean. We want to look a little bit at the, at the past. We want to look at you know, where we are, and we also want to think what's next and what, what, what role um, do youth organizations in civil society um, play. And I think... Um, absolutely best position to discuss that with me are the panelists who we have here and I will just um, I'll just name them very quickly and then I'll hand over to actually ask them to introduce themselves in more detail so ladies first we've got Annie here Annie um, Chivatse. Um, we have uh, Vasil Mirochenenko from Ukraine, um, Ani is from Georgia, sorry, and we got um, Hofstaff, um, Hofsep, sorry, Pat Bakanyan, uh, Hofsep is from Armenia. Now, um, I will go to you um, and um, ask you to introduce uh, yourselves, and um, we'll take a little bit of time for that, because I would like you to, to couple with your introduction a bit maybe two or three important kind of post-Soviet turning points um, in your country's um, history. You can pick them as you like um, and relate maybe the role you have played in those um, and or your memories that you connect to those, right? So let's hear from you who you are, but also, um, Give us a bit of introduction to your country and its its post Soviet trajectory um, with that. So, Ani, would you like to start? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Ani Chikwadze, uh, an alumni, as uh, Jan Philip mentioned. Right now, I'm in Washington, uh, where I am a journalist for Voice of America's uh, Georgian service. Before I start, I have to say that um, issue a disclaimer that I'm here in personal capacity and my views do not represent that of VOA or US government. Um, I joined UIP in 2009 uh, when I was like uh, 18 years old. Um, and since then, I've been very actively involved. Last years, obviously not anymore. I'm, I'm, I've been living in Washington for past seven years. Um, and uh, my reporting focuses on Russia, Eastern Europe, uh, security, Georgia, and the region. Um, so to start with, I don't know. I mean, where, where to start with? I, I don't know how much uh, everybody knows. I hope I don't bore anybody. But uh, as you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990s, in most of the region, and this is especially true for Georgia and Armenia, there was a chaos, there was civil wars, uh, there were like ethnic wars uh, that dominated the political life of, of these countries. I was uh, growing up um, in Tbilisi, in the outskirts of Tbilisi. Uh, there were not many opportunities for young people. We had no electricity, we had uh, no uh, heat. Uh, we would bring wood to school to, to heat. Uh, and, uh, um, and then uh, later on, and uh, we will talk more about this, but uh, somewhere around a decade later in Georgia, uh, transformation happened that was uh, quite dramatic. But before I get to that, uh, this chaos and uh, the post-Soviet, uh, how to call it, like the, the class that the Soviet Union uh, resulted into, the political elite, if you will, uh, uh, was uh, the old style elite, which was connected to, to um, you know, the groups in the government uh, that were controlling most of the uh, opportunities, if you, if you will. Uh, and young people at that point, if you had no connection, did not really have uh, much, much choice and this is where i think uip uip comes in uh, as as one of the players in this game to open up the field for other people like myself uh later on and um and then this whole thing transforms after the revolution into a much larger uh social movement i've met many people um for the record uh, 
Georgia's revolution in 2003, Rose Revolution has unleashed a wave of protests in the region, followed by Ukraine, then followed by Kyrgyzstan. And I will speak about Georgia. I, I know personally many people involved in this movement, uh, revolutionary movement, uh, who were previously part of some conferences organized by European Youth Parliament. At that point, the organization was not yet present in, in Georgia, but some people were still taking parts uh, here and there in the, in the conferences. Um, and so, in a way, some of the people connected to the European Youth Parliament, as well as uh, those who benefited from uh, larger European um, uh, kind of uh, showing of an interest towards the region, uh, which followed the wave of the revolutions. And you see uh, Europe, uh, by Europe, I mean Brussels, getting more active in, in these countries, in the region, in Georgia and Ukraine, in Armenia, uh, and rest of the region, really, you see the starting of Eastern part, no, European neighborhood policy in 2005, following the revolutions in Georgia and Ukraine, which more actively engaged civil society as well uh, to work uh, with the European Union. So I'll try to be short. I, I think we will talk more about this. But so to get a larger picture, we had the chaos, the disappointment, uh, the post-Soviet uh, entrenched corrupt elite, uh, corruption everywhere from schools to police to any institutions really which uh with the first wave of uh, protests uh, in early 2000s uh, in some of the countries i mentioned resulted into a more opening up of uh the institutions itself opportunities as well as uh, growing uh western and european interest uh, towards the region i'll, I'll end with that uh, don't want to take too much time and then we'll come back to this Thank you very much, Ani. Uh, fantastic. Let's go to let's go to to, to Armenia and hear your story, Hofsev. You are still on mute. We need to unmute you, or you need to unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Hofsev. Set for short. Some some of you might know me. Uh, some faces are new for me, and I'm glad to to be among you all today. Um, so I work for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development as an economist, and I also own my own firm, uh, Invest in Armenia, which basically deals with the investment in Armenia and helping investors uh, to be involved in different business activities here. But before that, uh, I was just the, um, uh, a kid that was born in 1990. I was actually born while the Soviet Union was still in place. It collapsed just one year afterwards. So my birth certificate has the USSR logo on it, actually. <laughs> um, so at the way Ani described in the 90s, um, it was the time when the USSR collapsed based on the vote of the people. So 100% of the people wanted to get out of the USSR, but mainly people didn't really understand what uh, will come next. And what came next uh, was the lack of institutions, uh, which led to um, lack of uh, building the, the, the state the way um, it should be built. I mean, the, the non-formal institutions that were in place, the corruption, the oligarchy, and many other adverse elements that came from the Soviet uh, heritage didn't let those societies to form in the way they could have been formed. Because all those countries um, that are present in the panel, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, they were once independent. And there is misconception amongst the people that the countries that were in the Soviet Union, they didn't exist before. And I hear a lot of times when, um, when you say Armenia, Georgia, or Ukraine, in many cases, they confuse it with Russia, and they consider this to be a, a big empire where all those countries, all those nations were, and didn't realize that these are the countries that are, most of them have a history dating back much longer than when Russia existed at all. Um, so <clears throat> after the, the 90s, the, the second stage can be described as the, the 2000s, the, we call it uh, with economists, the Caucasian tiger period where the double digit growth uh, was in place, mainly investing in the infrastructure um, and building the institutions, and which followed um, by the 2010 
and afterwards, when the, in case of Armenia, the, the revolution took place that eradicated all the, um, all the remnants of the um, post-Soviet heritage, um, being the corruption, the oligarchy, the non-formal institutions, the, the, uh, the fact that you need to have the connections to, to move forward and advance um, be it in, the, in the state institutions or in the private sector. And in all of those stages, um, in the first stage, I was a kid um, that was born um, seeing no electricity, no hot water. Uh, the hot water and the electricity actually came in place when I was six years old. Um, and then in the 2000s, I was a schoolboy uh, that was uh, enjoying his life, not having any idea what he wanted to do in life. Um, and then in 2010, I was already an active uh, youngster that started EYP in Armenia, actually. In 2011, we started EYP in Armenia. I was 21 back then. Uh, and right now, I, I can see how this whole path, how all those experiences have shaped the way we see the realities and the, the way we see the alternative reality that can be applied in our countries. This is in a nutshell. Offset, thank you so much. Uh, great, great introduction. I think it also gives us a, a, a good um, flavor. Um, fantastic. Thank you for this. Vasil, that's yeah. what you go to Ukraine. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Vasil. I'm, I'm from Ukraine and I'm very happy to be here with you here. So as an introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in business. I run a consultancy and we focus on public relations and public affairs in Ukraine. We now employ 30 people here, working with many international companies, working with big investors, and helping them actually, you know, navigate some of the um, uh, corridors of Ukraine's power, but also helping them, you know, get, work on their positive reputation and communicate better uh, with different stakeholders. Uh, also, I'm a civic activist. I was involved in, in setting up of three NGOs, and EYP was the first one, of course, going back 20 years ago. And later, I was involved in um, uh, founding Ukraine Crisis Media Center, which was a media NGO, which was set up in March of 2014 as a response to the Russian uh, intervention in Crimea and then later in eastern Ukraine. And uh, the major goal of the NGO was to amplify Ukraine's voice internationally and help communicate uh, what was going on here um, uh, to the world. And, um, and also, uh, at the same time, actually, and it was all inspired, by the way, by the Revolution of Dignity 2014, uh, I got involved with different Western University alumni organizations um, to set up another NGO called Professional Government Association. And the goal of, of that umbrella organization was to unite Western University alumni in Ukraine and help Ukraine with, uh, with reforms, with economic reforms. And uh, I, I will be able to talk more about it about later but now, you know, responding to your question on, on this uh, kind of watershed moments in, in Ukraine's history for the past 30 years. And they are definitely sort of, uh, I would link them up to three major uh, popular uprisings uh, because we, we, they, they were there. They all were different in their nature, in their origin and kind of in the impact and implications that they brought. But they were, you know, instrumental in, 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 in shaping where Ukraine is now. And uh, the first one of, was, of course, the, the 90s and, and the, the popular uprisings. And they have taken place in many of the post-Soviet countries. And uh, the, the one in Ukraine was in the 1990. And it was pretty much driven by the young people demanding Ukraine sovereignty, demanding the withdrawal of the Ukrainian soldiers who served in the Soviet army in different parts of the Soviet Union and outside of the Soviet Union. And that was a demand for, the, for, the actually, for their comeback to Ukraine. And, um, and in a way, uh, those protests uh, were kind of fundamental to, to creating a political um, culture here, but also kind of the first experience, which was still very scary in those days. And you have to take in mind that it was still the Soviet Union was still there. And 1990 was just one year after the popular uprising in, 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 um, in, in Georgia, which was uh, brutally um, crushed by the Soviet soldiers. Uh, around 20 people were killed with military spades. And that, that was a moment when those young people would show up at Maidan in Kiev and were demanding Ukrainian sovereignty. So those were kind of different times we lived in. People could still 
remember the uh, the Stalin. They could still remember all the um, uh, brutalities which had taken place 50 years before that. And still many of the Ukrainian dissidents uh, were in the gulags and were incarcerated. And, 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 and um, in a way, it was one of the first instances when Ukraine practiced nonviolent um, uh, protest. Uh, that was also, we pioneered with an idea of, of uh, setting up tents on the central square. It all happened in 1990. And in a way, this experience, and then we move into the 90s, right? Ukraine becomes independence. There are many difficulties. You know, we, we sort of see the advent of the wild capitalism. We see the rise of the oligarchs and all the kind of the problems we still kind of deal with even on a daily basis. But in those days, I think it was, it was a really uh, at a big scale. And this is what has helped uh, some of those people who had access to the, to the government accumulate huge um, wealth, uh, which was not uh, apparently distributed uh, in a just way and which have actually caused the emergence of the oligarchs, which are in a way hampering our democratic developments. Anyways, so another watershed, the second watershed moment happened 14 years later, and that was the Orange Revolution, what we call the Orange Revolution. And it was in a way a popular uprising uh, against uh, the rigged elections, political elections in Ukraine. And, um, and uh, the Orange Revolution, it actually uh, led to the revote, presidential revote, and we elected uh, Viktor Yushchenko as our president, uh, which which was a big victory for us in those days. And um, uh, I was just a graduate student. I just graduated from, from, from the university. That was by the time when we were all heavily involved in the EYP. And um, a lot of people from the EYP have participated and, and actually protested during the Orange Revolution. But still, I mean, I was still at the very young age. It was very difficult for me to still kind of, you know, fully feel um, the, 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 the kind of the protest moment. And, uh, but the story has changed uh, uh, later, actually, in 2013, uh, when we all have faced the, the revolution of dignity. And the, the difference, the major difference was actually that was driven by uh, the fact that the government of Ukraine in 2013 have decided to change their mind and refuse to sign the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. So it was one of those big popular uprisings, which was driven by this European ideas and by actually by somebody who is trying to steal a European future from the, uh, you know, from the next generation of Ukrainians. So that was a phenomenal moment when we saw the protest actually uh, started by people carrying uh, European flags. And I think this is, was quite a rare moment, which, which is very difficult to imagine even for many EU member states, uh, how often they wave the European flag and it was waved here in Central Square. And um, of course, the way the, the protest has developed, I mean, it led, it was, it, it was, it, it became much more violent and, uh, and, and, and then, um, you know, uh, but, but probably sort of from, from a standpoint of civil society, what, what it was one of this, you know, major moments of inclusivity because Maidan as, as a popular uprising has brought together people from different walks of life, uh, from different regions, from different ethnic groups. Uh, we had Ukrainians, we had you know, Jews, we had ethnic Russians, uh, we had Crimean Tatars, all protesting together. People, wealthy, rich, uh, you know, middle, uh, middle, middle, middle income people. It was a joy and celebration of diversity. And what was very important, the people have learned how to mobilize themselves and actually self reliability on themselves. And that this is very important because I believe what has happened later during the next seven years after that was that experience going back to eight years now almost that um, led to the emergence of many new NGOs or, and, 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 and actually emergence of, of like volunteer groups. Now we have many of the veteran groups, but also of their organizations working and helping either with reforms or helping with I mean, working on human rights issues, different kind of issues, but that experience of, of self mobilization and getting united was instrumental for them. And of course, I can go on forever about that, but I would just like to, you know, sort of still highlight some of the personal memories because I think they 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 are, you know, something which which uh, probably, you know, are very important. And 
and the 90s, you see, I was, I was 10 years old, so I was kind of older than HOSAP when, when the whole union collapsed. We still can re remember, um, though it's, it's now can be blurred a little bit, but I remember I, I grew up in a small rural town in Western Ukraine. My parents uh, were medical doctors in a local hospital. And, uh, and I can just imagine how difficult it was for them. They were just about the age probably that I'm right now and how uncertain the future looked for them uh, because all the savings were gone. Uh, the salaries were so tiny, you couldn't afford anything. Uh, you know, just to give you an idea, it was probably like $10 per month that was the salary of a medical doctor. And then nobody knew what was gonna happen uh, next. And, uh, and of course we saw uh, what was going on in different other countries, the, the, the kind of all these armed conflicts in the Caucasus, in Transnistria. And of course there was like, there was lots of uncertainty in those days. And, um, and then kind of my memories of the Orange Revolution uh, still kind of now when, when I can compare Orange Revolution to the Revolution of Dignity, that was probably kind of a Disneyland uh, because it was so peaceful and nice. Nobody got hurt, not nobody got, got there was no, 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 pretty much no violence uh, in a way. Uh, but of course there was a major disillusionment and disappointment because the political leaders who became, uh, got the leadership as a result of it, they didn't deliver on their promises. So there was huge disappointment and which kind of led to the re-election of the villain of the Orange Revolution as a president. And the, 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 the 2014, it was a turning point in kind of helping Ukraine shape the political national identity of Ukraine, which is not based on ethnicity, but rather based on political issues and which kind of united people. And to a great extent, it was also driven by the um, uh, you know, ensuing Russian uh, intervention in Ukraine grabbing of Crimea and the military intervention. And, and this war that has been you know, going on for the past seven years have actually uh, you know, really created a very strong national identity within Ukraine and uh, kind of destroyed the Russian world concept, which Russia has been promoting here for a long time. I would be happy to talk more about it, but, 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 but I just one more thing about the, uh, the, the EVIP. So EVIP was launched here in 2000 and 2001, uh, I was there and actually with my, my friends, a lot of them were actually FLEX alumni, which is a US government high school exchange program. We all got back from the US and we we're looking for different opportunities, what we could do as university students. And then this idea of actually uh, my friend, uh, Oles Benova, she went to a session of the EYP in Switzerland in the year 2000. So she went there, she came back and then she got all her friends from, from the Flex alumni community and from her university saying, look, here is this unique opportunity for us to, to, to experience what Europe is, what, what political debate is. And, and here is a simulation of the parliamentary procedures. And, and it's so exciting. Why don't we get involved? And, uh, and we did, and we did, we got involved. And, uh, and it's interesting that now 20 years later, uh, the organization is still around. And I'll be more than happy to talk more about what I believe was the major impact of the youth organizations such as EYP on general on the civil society in Ukraine. Thank you, thank you so much, and thanks to thanks to all of you. We'll go right back to that that point in just a second because I think that's that's very exciting. Um, I don't want to go into a big sort of academic exercise now, st structuring things, but I was wondering a bit hearing you talk, and um, whether it's fair to say that, of course. There is um, there's for all those countries we're talking about today that own history, of course, right? Also, you, you mentioned that that it would be so stupid to just, you know, I mean, you 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 said, well, you know, it's it's not Russia and, and, and all that. I think that's all clear to all of us here in the call, but there's this own strong legacy. At the same time, there may be commonalities now, right? Post 1990s. I think all of you mentioned that this this lack and collapse of all the institutions, the resulting chaos in the 90s. Uh, Vasil, you said no savings all of a sudden, right? Um, breakdown of the currency, complete uncertainty for probably almost all, most of the layers of society, economic downturn, um, and then of course also the rise then um, with maybe economic turnarounds but also the rise of those um of those of oligarchs corrupt elites that would would capitalize on some of that wealth that was re-emerging and then these uprisings and revolutions that all of these countries have seen now um 
is that um it is that fair to 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 kind of establish these commonalities is this um is this is this useful or is this maybe also from a bigger political picture also a risk because you then kind of get into a get into a turn of saying well countries are all following sort of a similar a similar path any of you want to ask to this i i mean we don't we're not going to stay along we're not going to have a super academic debate but you know i'm a political scientist so i'm interested in this <laughs> Annie. I'll just say I'll I'll just say that yeah of course there are differences and commonalities of course these uh, countries have different trajectories you see Ukraine Georgia Armenia as well now going on actively on the path of democracy then you see some uh, you know you see what's happening in Belarus and so on but to put it in a one commonality one big picture it would be that in all these countries you have um, this movement that. You know, is a product of the 90s that we talked about of all this like corruption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and this idea of uh, traditionalists, uh, those who are um, trying to bring these countries back, and then you saw emergence with the critical help of civil society of pro-Europe, pro-democracy, pro-individual rights and freedom movement. So the larger arc of this story in a way for most of these countries is this, um, if you will, the fight for, for the values and uh, for the ideas of those who wanna live in, be part of Europe and in, live in a society where they have their rights guaranteed and those who uh, wrapped in, a, in an idea of traditionalism uh, or I don't know what you would uh, call it uh, and mostly are connected to, to Russia and are uh, talking about the Soviet past uh, and are nostalgic about Soviet past uh, there is this struggle between uh, these two forces, and I think this is a defining struggle. And in this struggle, EYP, and you mentioned FLEX as well, the Western involvement at large to help uh, this uh, uh, civil society groups and young people coming uh, up with this idea, demanding that they want more freedom. They don't. They want to have water. They want to have security. Uh, they want to be able to demonstrate freely um, in the streets and so on. Uh, it's like is is this one like uh, uh is the creating factor or like aiding factor uh of of how all these revolutions that we talked about and how these social transformations happened in these countries and continue to happen so alongside with the young generation and the help in the west uh, we are you can say that uh we are on this european side of this battle uh, that i just described so um, i will let others speak Thank you, thank you so much, Anin. Yeah, indeed, Vasil Hofstep would be interested in your in, in your comments on this. I think it's an interesting piece you mentioned there, Anin, about this kind of, um, let's say, a bit of this cleavage of those maybe backward looking, being nostalgic, and those that that want to progress and so on, of being a maybe a defining factor. Is that is that true for all the countries? And then what decisive role do do youth organizations civil society organizations play in this in um do they deepen that divide do they um, um how does that how does that look well thank you um well those countries have the similarities because they've had around 70 years of the similar path they uh, took under the Soviet uh, under the Soviet Union. Uh, so it was obvious that from the 90s they will follow certain path in the similar manner. Of course, some countries were different from the others. And it was obvious that in case you are talking about the not consolidated authoritarian regime, that at some point in any of those countries there will be a change of the uh, perception, change of the, in the people's mentality. Uh, and this is what happened in all the four countries, um, Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova. In other cases, when there is consolidated authoritarian regime, it was hard to, to progress in this way. But um, this obviously couldn't be the case if the civil society wasn't active enough. Um, in Armenia, those civic initiatives started as early as 2003 and 4, and it was obvious that it, it's, it's getting the, the pace 
um, the pace it requires to build a bigger momentum that was built around 10, uh, 14 years afterwards with a bigger movements. Obviously, the organizations like EYP and many other organizations, youth organizations, they create an alternative reality for you to see what the educational system can be, what the uh, raising uh, your voice can be like, and how the policy making procedures can be applied. Because in our case, when we recall the record of EYP Armenia's resolutions and activities that we've implemented, in many cases, that those were afterwards adopted at the ministerial level or in the municipalities in, the, in certain cities in Armenia. So this was a very important initiative in our case, also because there was a lack of these kind of big youth organizations. That's why when we started this in 2011, in only two, three years, it has become one of the most active UIP representations and it gathered around 3000 members in two, three years. So when you look at the um, at the record of the international forums and the, the sessions that we have, um, it was based on the demand from the beneficiaries who worked with. And those beneficiaries, when you look back at the events and the movements that were taking place in Armenia, they were the active um, the active members of those movements. There were people who even led those movements. As a result of the Velvet Revolution in 2018. We had around six parliament members that were EYP alumni. Uh, at the moment, we have a minister of social and labor affairs who is an EYP alumni. And we have the uh, deputy head of the Human Rights Committee in the parliament who is an EYP alumni and board member. So when, when you look back at the impact EYP has had in here, it was huge. And this impact is not only descriptive, it's with the figures I just mentioned. Very impressive. Um, Vasil, your perspectives um, um, from Ukraine, how, how important have youth organizations been and also the EYP, of course, in, in, in particular, what cases can we look at? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the, the role of youth uh, was instrumental in kind of all the popular uprisings which have taken place in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, for youth, it's kind of easy because uh, young people, usually they kind of don't have any obligations. They don't have a mortgage. Uh, they kind of uh, don't care that much. And they kind of risk takers, right? And also they get tired. They are not ready to tolerate. And, and, and hence, in a way, you know, they serve as this, um, uh, uh, they provide this impulse, right? They react to something, they go out and they get more risk averse. They don't care, I mean, in a way, or they don't think of the, possible negative implications of what can happen if they get arrested or beaten up. It's in a way kind of, when you are young, you are more kind of revolutionary in a way. And I think that was that was very important in all these contexts. Of course, to sustain it and to actually then transform this energy into institutions in the building of institutions is actually more difficult, right? Because this is where you need experience. This is where you need a little bit of more knowledge, specific knowledge, which you need for building the institutions. Nevertheless, this initial impulse, which always is given by the youth, is so important, right? In 2013, those were the young people and students of the universities in Kiev who marched the streets of Kiev carrying the flags and they were demanding a European future, you know, and, and Europe for them was something not, uh, ephem eph not ephemeral, it was something which they could, they could see, it was, you know, the, 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 because of the travel, because of uh, more easy access to the European countries, and for instance, for all the EYP uh, who were involved in the EYP, they, you know, they, it was kind of become much more easier to see what it is, how the European society is working, what are the standards of living, uh, level of social security, of the human rights, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this, this is kind of what is forming your future and, and how it's, uh, it's shaping. And, and in a way, you know, EYP in those days, 20 years ago, we were pretty much the first youth organization which was promoting all this European Union in Ukraine, um, uh, as it was by running different events, running national sessions, hosting several international sessions here in Kiev. And, and for us and for all the people who are involved, it was a, a unique ex uh, opportunity to, to gain new skills, to gain managerial skills, to gain fundraising skills, uh, to 
you know, learn how to run campaigns, how to recruit people, how to, you know, how to do public speaking. And, and, and that was extremely important in whatever careers people have decided to follow after their EVIP experience. And um, uh, like, uh, I I'm very impressed by the stats from Armenia because uh, of the six MPs for EVIP alumni, we only have three in Ukraine. Uh, now, maybe we'll have more, but we, we actually uh, have two members who are in the opposition right now and one is from the ruling party, but we are still very proud of that fact that, that we have alumni in the Ukrainian parliament. Also, we have one alumnus who is a deputy head of the state, state property fund, which is a major kind of government institution which runs state-owned enterprises, which is kind of privatizing them. Uh, he's also there. Um, so that we can see, and you know, I, 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 when I interviewed these people and talked to them, all of them have actually recalled that uh, the experience they gained in the EYP helped them out in, in their careers as they moved on, uh, either to start their own business or in their political activism or anything what they were doing. And so, so and, 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 and that, therefore, I, this is where I see the value, the huge value of youth organizations generally. I remember that we often at the EYP we would cooperate with IJ, which is another kind of a European um, organization. It was a European movement. There was also ISEC, a, you know, organization for the economists. Uh, and, and, and there is PLUST, which is kind of a, a, voice, a scouting organization in Ukraine, uh, which is also very important. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of, um, you know, you see how vibrant it is. And, and it also helped to, you know, and now also I would like to add something on the, on the trajectories of different countries from the post-Soviet world, because apparently all the countries have gone in different, you know, kind of ways. You know, we, we see the Baltic countries, which probably progressed most of all, right? They're members of NATO, members of the EU, and have, you know, built prosperous countries out there. Then we see the countries of, of, of uh, uh, which have uh, chosen, um, uh, you know, unluckily for the people of those countries, authoritarian paths like Russia and Belarus and, and Central Asian countries. And, and, and now, like, when you look at Russia, the recent changes to the constitution will, will secure the Putin's presidency until 2036. So we're not going to see much change there and next door. Um, nevertheless, countries like Ukraine and Moldova and, and Belarus and now more recently, more you can hear it from Armenia, uh, have, uh, you know, have a multi-party system. We have the change of governments. We have elections. Maybe they are not perfect. We have kind of plurality of opinions, which is the, which you can hear from, from, from through, you know, kind of media, which, which is not perfect, but at the same time, which is owned by different groups. And it offers you enough plurality and diversity in kind of different opinions. So it's, it's kind of a different way and different democratic society we are building. And the two years ago, we, I mean, the whole kind of huge um, moment which happened from a standpoint of political science, and it's gonna be gonna get into the books of how a Ukrainian comedian uh, had won the presidency with such a huge, uh, uh, you know, vote of support, which was phenomenal. I mean, and this, is, this is something unbelievable which has happened. And of course, it was extremely populistic, we still uh, don't know what it's going to bring. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you know, for better or for worse, it actually have have helped to, you know, revamp the whole political establishment uh, to a great extent. You know, for, and and I think that that served us a good purpose. No matter what, I mean, you know, just I still believe that it was a good thing which has happened. Um, you know, still kind of difficult to see the positive outcomes of this major change. But you know the fact that we can change the elites and they can be changed so drastically. I think this is a phenomenon which Ukraine is really proud of. Thanks, Cecil. Uh, fantastic, great perspectives. Look, before we open for for for, for questions in our round here, I have um, two more things that I want to dive into, and 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 one is um, I want to ask you how. Um, looking a bit at external actors, right? I think who are also kind of important in this in in this game. Um, well, not game. Let's say this development shouldn't be called a game. Um, so, how over time have your perspectives on, say, on the West, right? Be that Europe or also the U.S. Um, as well as um, as well as Russia, as the other big neighbor, how those perspectives evolve? Vasil, you quickly already touched upon Russia in, 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 in your answer um, earlier, but how, how is that, if, if at all, how, how has these, 
how have your 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 thoughts about these big neighbors um, evolved over time? Anyone who would like to go? Seb, maybe you want to start? You're still on mute. You need to, you need to click there, please. Sorry, I always forget this. <clears throat> yeah, so when you look at the, um, at the time frame from 90s, obviously in the 90s and up until the 2000s, Russia was the dominant player in all of the countries. Uh, with no exception. Um, with the involvement of the European Union and institu institutionalization of the European Union presence in here by creating the Eastern Partnership as the phenomenon as such, uh, this has brought a new perspective for the people living here, including myself. Um, so basically, when you look at the, um, at the perceptions of people, in, in Armenia at least, um, it's considered that the European Union is the partner that will um, always assist when it comes to the institutional development, when it comes to the bettering the human rights or doing the reforms in the area, investing in the infrastructure. And you can see this in a lot of major projects in here. And this year, the European Union has also confirmed a 2.6 billion investment package for Armenia for the upcoming four years. So European Union is quite engaged here. And as much as the more it is engaged, the more the people benefit from this, the more their perception of the European Union changes. Because in the 90s and up until 2000s, the Europe was considered to be the place where we associate ourselves when it comes to the culture and values. Um, because the, when you look at the cultural heritage in Armenia, it it leads towards the European rather than any other amongst the big players in the region. Um, and in, in the recent years um, and in 2018, um, the, the, the spectrum that we have with the relations with Russia and European Union is that with the, on one hand, we're a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, which gives us the access to, to the markets of Russia, Kazakhstan, and other Central Asian countries. But at the same time, we have signed the comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement with the European Union and the GSP Plus regime, which allows us to enter the European markets with 6,200 product lines with zero tariffs or reduced tariffs. Basically, this is kind of the balance we're trying to find, being a landlocked country. And this is exactly what the perception of people are when it comes to the to understanding the the roles of the two countries and two big players in in this region obviously when it comes to the security related matters um, mostly both the state and the people are leaning towards russia but this is because you you don't have a collective european counterpart to this of course you have nato but nato is not purely european um, counterpart to what Russia uh, and the other countries are, especially given the fact that there is Turkey in NATO, which Armenia has a bit of a bad record with when it comes to the Armenian genocide and other matters. So this is basically the trajectory of the perceptions that we've had over the 30 years between European Union and Russia. So thank you. Oh, same muting mistake. And um, Ali, how does it look from Georgia? But also maybe you, also yeah. your, your own perspective, right? When it comes to Europe, potentially yeah. Europe versus Russia. Well, Georgia, I guess, is a, is a in a way, or was. Uh, it's hard to say today. Uh, we'll get to that. But it's a success story of this. The uh, population in Georgia is overwhelmingly pro-European, pro-NATO. It's in the 60s and 70s. The support you know, according to the public opinion. Um, and uh, this is a result of, of all this uh, discussion that we are having, the transformation 
uh, we saw in early 2000s in Georgian, Georgian case, the civil society included many UIP alumni and so on were absorbed by post-revolutionary government after 2003 into reforming the country. And then this resulted into the success stories of post-Soviet transformation uh, when it came to getting rid of corruption, when it came to building institutions and uh, so on. Once you saw this movement, once you saw this new, new generation with no touch with Soviet nomenclature uh, leading the transformation, in a way, with that going on the ground, the European interest also grew. And, you know, Hossep mentioned uh, Eastern Partnership, which was also added after Georgian-Russian uh, War, and it was uh, uh, an initiative to bring all these former Soviet countries closer to Europe economically and, uh, you know, travel-wise and uh, otherwise. Um, in terms of, like, uh, with Russia, obviously, uh, this uh, Russia, in a way, represents a rejection of what we don't want to see in our own countries, uh, considering the limits of freedom over there, considering, uh, you know, the, the situation when it comes to state control and 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 so on. So when you talk about West and uh, or Europe or Russia, this is not uh, something like, you know, just hypothetical. It's very, for people, it's very uh, physical in, in, in a way, because it means like that you can, you know, go to the university without paying a bribe. It also means that you can, uh, I, I don't know, like be able to leave the country and come back. It, it, for media, it means you can report openly on things. And so it's like very concrete, uh, concrete things. Um, and to to answer your question directly on it, personally, personally, I think also it's important that like all of us, I think I know Hofsep, I see Anya here uh, as well. And of course, I see Alan, who's been fighting for, uh, for Belarus for a very, very long time. And uh, now uh, UIP was... Uh, uh, a way of us all connecting with each other, the people with the uh, same values, I guess, or sharing the uh, same uh, idea of what uh, we want our countries to look like. And then uh, these days, all of us ended up in different uh, countries, different places, doing different things, but still uh, being in touch to a certain extent when, when it comes uh, uh, comes to like uh, the development that our countries are, uh, the course of development our countries are taking. Uh, one critical thing also, I think, uh, that was that UIP played a role in is as well as the skepticism. You know, you hear us, we talk about Europe, we say that it means a lot to us, but often there is a skepticism in a, uh, among the countries in Europe. Uh, even in UIP, you could hear this in during the debates and so on. That like maybe we are not European, or uh, maybe it's like too much to bring us on board, and and so on. And I think um, to have an opportunity uh, to meet with each other, to meet with the Central Western European uh, people and Georgians, Ukrainians, Armenians, with that also UIP created a generation or a group of people in different countries that uh, that share, uh, you know, that kind of understand what we are fighting for and uh, want to be uh, helpful uh, in that. So I'll end, end with that. Thank you so much. Basil, maybe brief. Yeah, it's evolved when you look, look at Look, I mean, um, that's a very good question. But but you see, uh, having Russia um, next door and uh, having Russia pursuing their own imperialistic kind of ambitions makes it um, very difficult for, for many countries in the region. And of course, they differ from country to country. And then, of course, I understand the Armenian case. They just depend on security issues as Russia. In our case, uh, Russia is promoting their concept of the Russian world, which goes back to the 19th century, which is totally updated. But for them, uh, Ukraine is at the heartland of this Russian world concept, right? And, um, and their idea of, of, of what they, you know, with the outbreak of the war in 2014, when they intervened, when they tried to manufacture artificial pro-Russian movements in some of the, you know, cities of, of the East and of the South, uh, have all failed. And this is, was a major moment what has happened. And I think this is what Putin has totally kind of uh, um, overestimated. For him, he had a feeling that if people are Russian speaking, they are probably belong to the Russian world and they support Russia. And he was, it was a big surprising moment for him to see in Dnipro, to see it in Odessa, and even Kharkiv, which, you know, traditionally are more pro-Russian than, than cities of Eastern or Western uh, Ukraine. Nevertheless, they didn't support this Russian world idea. 
and he kind of missed it big time. And now um, I think there is no opportunity for Russia to come back here as a result of what has happened, as a result of actually 14,000 people, Ukrainians being killed. We now have so many families which have their relatives or no people who were killed by, by, by in, the, in fighting uh, the Russians in the East. And, and then uh, uh, also uh, 2 million people are internally displaced people, 2 million people. This is so huge. And, you know, and I believe that's a major achievement of the Ukrainian government that we managed to actually take care of those internally displaced people. They didn't end up in the, in the, on the EU border, so they could probably, right? But they, they didn't. So which I believe it's, it's, you know, of course, there was huge help coming from all the European countries and others. And, um, uh, you know, going back to the revolution of dignity, as I said, I mean, the fact that um, uh, the president Yanukovych decided not to sign the EU-Ukraine association agreement, which is still pretty much a trade agreement. And of course, there is a political clause. But the problem with this kind of agreement is it, it doesn't stipulate clear kind of future for our membership, right? And this is where we kind of, in a way, stuck. We, we are stuck because of the political situation in the EU with, you know, with a lack of appetite to any further enlargement. And, and we see here, you know, a belligerent Russia next door, uh, you know, which, which, which is capable of of maintaining a simmering conflict for for a very long time, right? Having Ukraine kind of uh, making us an unattractive partner for major investors or uh, or for any kind of more closer cooperation with the EU, et cetera, et cetera. But but we you know we've learned uh, how to survive. You know before the war we had we traded we had thirty percent trade was with Russia. Now it's only seven. We've it boosted our trade with with the EU. We boosted our trade with China. So we found some of the alternatives. We've learned how to enter new markets. And that, that was a phenomenal moment. It was a big learning curve uh, for us. And, 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 and at the same time, you know, the popularity of Russia have dropped so heavily. So now, like if you 10 years ago, you could still have a pro-Russian party winning elections and even getting their president in place. This is what happened with Yanukovych in 2010. Now, any political party in Ukraine, which has pro-Russian views, can maximum get 20%. So they have no ability to kind of, you know, create a government uh, and, and the popularity for the Russian narratives and the Russia has dropped significantly. And I'm not sure they, there is a chance for that to come back. And um, especially along with kind of uh, in this huge uh, feeling of, of, of the national identity, which has much, I mean, even speaking of the language, though, I believe it's not always a defining moment. I have many of my Russian speaking friends who, who switch into Ukrainian after what has happened 10 years ago, right? They just realized, look, I mean, why should we be, you know, why don't we speak Ukrainian? And it was kind of their response to what was going on, right? Um, and, um, and, um, and that's, that's an interesting, interesting development that we are seeing here. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. So before we go to the questions, I see that Alan already um, has one. I want to have one, one, just one concluding um, round, you know, keeping, keeping in mind that, um, all of your impressive track records in um, youth leadership um, in EYP and beyond. Um, and by the way, I think we should do a, a meeting with those MPs um, that you mentioned that have all been in EYP. I think that would be great. Um, but, you know, if you were now to give um, advice, be it to your children, uh, speaking of children, there's one coming, um, um, to your children or, or just the next generation, right? Whatever you prefer. What would that piece of advice be for like next generation youth leaders? What are, what are the, from your perspective, what's the, what's the things to, to jump on now? What are the nuts to crack? What's the, what are the roles to play? Is there one or two things that you want to share? Seb, we we'll start with you. <laughs> <coughs> I would just wish, um, given the, the recent events of last year and the, the bitter war Armenia has, uh, has witnessed, I would wish um, for my kids and for kids of every, every citizen of every country that has had conflict because of the Soviet Union heritage and because of the Soviet Union, post-Soviet Union realities. And I think we, all the panelists have uh, can can relate to this. I wish they, our kids live uh, in countries that have no conflicts, and they they don't have to worry about what the peace would look like, 
uh, how, how their politicians will figure out the relations with their neighbors. And they, they don't have to worry about the, the security related matters. And the only thing they worry about is what to wear in school and uh, what to study, what they want to become when they grow up with no other fear in their heads. This is my only wish. And I think this, this is something that our parents wished for us as well. Unfortunately, we didn't see that, but uh, I'm sure every parent would wish this for, for their future generations. Thanks, Seb. Annie? Uh, hard to wish something. I, I, I don't even know what I want to have for lunch now. And <laughs> I was thinking about children, but I'll, I'll try. I'll try. I think I'm, uh, for me, the main, uh, main thing here is, uh, uh, as you see the backsliding in many of these countries, and you know, Seb mentioned all of our countries, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, we have gone through, uh, through war and you know, it, it, also Moldova, if you add to that. Um, and we've gone through instability, we've gone through the social change. And in some countries now there is a back backsliding. There is backsliding also within Europe in some countries that is breeding skepticism, skepticism about uh, whether you can transform for former Soviet uh, republics, can you do that? Or is this like hopelessly Soviet that you cannot do anything about it? So my one thing for you know people coming after us, generations coming after us and also UIP generations or our uh, kids would be don't uh, become skeptics uh, because, you know, people in these countries, in Georgia, Ukraine, uh, and Armenia, uh, and in the region, one example being Georgi Tabagari, who is a founder of EYP Georgia, are fighting for very uh, specific, concrete things, like very basic freedoms, like Tabagari, who has been beaten up three months ago, demonstrating for LGBT rights in, in central Tbilisi. Uh, and he was recently also almost, um, well, arrested and brief released briefly. Many in Belarus as well are, are fighting for the same thing. This fight is long. It will take time. There is no guarantee that we will get there. But uh, remember that uh, you know, these are people who believe in West and in West, if we don't believe in you, uh, in a way you need us also to believe in you because otherwise you can be like, you know, large countries with nuclear weapons, but uh, nothing else. We need, you need people who believe in these freedoms, the European values and, um, and uh, democracy in a way. And, and, the, and the last thing I would add to this is that this is, and Russia has defined this, uh, uh, as, as a battle for, for values for, um, uh, you know, in the Soviet Union, uh, it has described West as disinterested. It has described West as uh, corrupt and, uh, and, you know, pro, they call it gay ropa even, and so on. Like they, they've chosen this, they've picked up this fight. And in this fight, it's important that those on the other side also believe in their own ideas and believe that uh, freedom and democracy will in the end of the they prevail. We don't know when, but well, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Yeah, a little dramatic, but yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. So Vasil, what's the what what what's the goal plan for your Look, kids? Look, I mean, there's kind of <laughs> <laughs> you see, I mean, uh, it's kind of there are several questions here, several topics which were raised. But speaking of uh, you know the next generation and. Um, you know, my daughter is 18, uh, so, um, and this is like the Generation Z is so different. I mean, we are talking about TikTok generation, right, in a way. And, 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 and also because of being a father and, 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 and of, 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 you know, you know, of a teenager now, you know, we're growing up. It's, it's kind of things which were so exciting to me when I was 18 are different for this kind of generation. And, um, and I, I guess we just have to accept it um, because uh, uh, there's always, you know, this generational gap that we face. But at the end of the day, every time I talk to uh, an audience of young people, I always encourage them to be proactive, uh, to, to, to do something beyond their studies. Uh, to get involved in youth organizations and, 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 and just demonstrate their leadership in any way possible, you know, either fighting for an, an environmental cause or, you know, or volunteering for a candidate running for, you know, for a public office uh, or just running a student conference. I, I yeah, that's kind of the, the message that I always send to the younger people because I say, look, I mean, this is, 
what you do when you're young. This is what's going to be shaping you, uh, you know, when you grow up. Uh, because all this uh, little steps which you make, you can uh, achieve a result, you achieve success. And, 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 and then by learning how you do it, you then replicate this experience and can just go on, go on, go on. And that could be a kind of, in a way, the experience which will be reinforcing itself and helping you out progress in, 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 in your careers, right? And of course, speaking of the future, I do hope that um, uh, if not the, my generation, but the generation of the kids of my kids, I mean, depending on when it's going to happen, they, they, they will live in a prosperous European um, nation. And, and, and if, if EU will be still around, we'll be part of the EU. <laughs> I hope you guys stay because <laughs> otherwise uh, we don't want to have uh, Putin's dream come true. You see, I mean, uh, because in a way what Ani has um, um, talked about, uh, and this is very kind of, it's just um, so close to me because I've spent so many years actually fighting Russian disinformation and just studying the, all the Russian narratives they are promoting, uh, you know, in a way that, that the whole gay Europe, which is out there, is decadent and it's collapsing. And if you, we, um, Ukraine Crisis Media Center, we analyzed uh, Russian media uh, for the period of three years, uh, three major Russian televisions. And the, we have actually looked at all the European countries in Europe overall of where Russian media coverage had, was any, at any time positive. And it was 90% negative. There was no positive stories from any EU country. There were kind of several exceptions from Europe. I think Switzerland was one of those, maybe because lots of Russian money is kept in Switzerland. But for the rest of Europe, it was always bad. It was extremely negative. And this is kind of, you know, and then when you realize how, how, how the public opinion is being shaped there and, um, and, and, and how it's done, it's, it's, it's really scary. But it's very important to talk about those issues which I mentioned, freedom, independence, uh, human rights, and all these European values. Because in a way, when you live in a well-off country in Europe, you kind of uh, lose track of it. You don't feel the, the value of freedom. You cannot really feel it because you've always had it. You take it for granted. And I think what the value of our countries is that we really know what's, what, 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 what's in there and how precious it is, especially when you lose it. Now, you know, observing the situation in, in Belarus for the past year is heartbreaking, right? Because for us Ukrainians, we felt like, oh, if we succeeded, they can probably also succeed. And many Ukrainians have tried to support and still keep on supporting. Many Belarus uh, uh, have uh, people from Belarus flat, and they are now in Kiev, in Ukraine. Some of them left for Poland. But this is a phenomenal thing, and, and they're not succeeding. And this is heartbreaking for us. Thank you, Rasil. Um strong words there and I am um, just just very briefly from my perspective I felt that that was always a very very strong aspect at least for me for EYP because it offered this possibility also for you know me having grown up in in, in Germany to to very naturally and quickly just um change just change perspective and through that also actually learn a lot about your own country right and 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 I think wherever you go right be it east or west or south or so, and I think this is a, this is one of the remarkable qualities that that, that EYP has, um, and and doing that, doing something extremely meaningful, right? There's nothing artificial. You're just immersed in in those different environments and 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 connect to um, and connect to people, and and learn a lot about yourself, your own country, and people as well as others. So I think this is really one of the amazing qualities that EYP has. Now, um, pause for a moment. Questions, comments from everyone who is here with us tonight to our great panelists. You can raise your hand. We're not so many. I'll be able to handle this. I'm quite confident. Um, so, or you can write in the chat if you prefer that. Alan, why does this not surprise me? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I won't answer that question. And by the way, I'm sitting in a car with three dogs on the north of Scotland. And all of you will have heard of Glen Morangi whiskey. So I'm about one kilometer from the place where that stuff is made, at least most of the stuff that appears in airports. Um, well, I'm really good to hear. It's good. It, it yeah, comes it, 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 it's, that you're not coming produced. back from the place. In although although not in the volumes that appear in all the airports, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> but anyway, um, and it's, I'm very honored to be um, um, you know, raising a question with such an amazing group of heroes of 
East European Civil Society development. And big, big thanks to Jan Philippe and EYP for bring, bringing together the, the, the power of the organization. I think uh, when we see it come together and the history that's here. Um, I'll, I'll give the question so that our panel can, can think about it. And then if I can just make a, a brief comment, which is intended to supplement the question. Often people do the other way around. That way Jan Philippe can cut me off and, and we'll still have the question in there. Um, the question is about sustainability. Um, we got some success stories here, don't we know it? But we got to be honest, not, not everything has quite worked in civil society in Eastern Europe, and we've got EYP case histories. Um, so I, I, I'd be interested to hear the comments of our, our panelists on, on what, I mean, we've already had some to some extent about the, the secret of how things got going, um, but what, what do you see as the necessary ingredients that will allow civil society to, to develop, develop energetically, and also in what is important, a sustainable way. That gosh, we're hearing Vazil, it's passing from generation to generation in some places now. Jan Philippe's doing his bit for that too. Um, we're, 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 you know, sustainability, that means we the, the ball will keep rolling um, even without the initial people. So what, what is the formula there? And, and just to give some, some key words, I mean, this is something I've thought a, a lot about having been involved in all the countries and many more. Um, you know, how, how do things work? It, it's a, clearly a very complex set of parameters. It's not just the geography of the country. And by the way, I've always felt if only we could just swap Georgia with Moldova, my goodness, you might just be in the right geopolitical place. Um, Armenia, I'm beginning to think we should swap you with Belarus and we could just shove Belarus a bit more deeper into the Soviet uh, preserve and have, uh, wouldn't Armenia like to have nice countries like Poland and Lithuania and Ukraine as, as, as neighbours, but you'd still have the eastern border to worry about. Um, so the, the, what, what, what these differences are, there's ethnic, there's cultural, there's a geographical location. And, and it does mean that, you know, within these boundaries, um, as we know with the, the richness of EYP, if every delegation comes different. So what about the sustainability formula? I'd like to hear that. Thanks, Alan. Who wants to give the, the answer to this riddle first? Annie, here we go. I'll, I'll be very brief, even though, Alan, you ask 10 questions. Um, <laughs> before I get to the answer, uh, there is this famous Onion article, actually, you know, written during the Georgia-Russian war that, that goes like, uh, George W. Bush tells Georgia not to border Russia. <laughs> They're like, if you continue bordering Russia, there is nothing we can do to help you. Uh, but to answer your question shortly, I think uh, first question, as far as there is something to fight for, these organizations will, will continue to exist and these movements will, will not die. So that's all. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with only on this. Whenever there is a cause, uh, the institutions are already there, the civil society organizations in the form of the associations, in the form of the uh, different institutionalized bodies are there to progress this cause. And when it comes to the EYP sustainability, it will be sustainable when the start was given right and when each of the next executive body works well into living the the new generation after uh, after them so i've seen this in armenia we started in 2011 2010 2011 uh, i'm not aware of what's going on in uyp armenia for the past five four years uh, but i see that a lot of activities are going on there meaning that there is interest and there is a demand for this kind of activities. Thanks, Seb. Great. Was yeah. you that sustainability? Yeah. Look, um, sustainability for the for the for the kind of civil society overall. I think um, that the goal of the civil society is to keep the government accountable and to to keep the government uh, effective. And um, in a way, 
you know, we in the Soviet Union were kind of so paternalistic, we expected the government to take care of everything. And I think it's changed now. Uh, we now understand that we need to take responsibility and that's a sign of a free person to take this responsibility because only the grassroots movement, this is what can keep the government on its toes and keep, them, uh, keep it accountable. So I think that's very important. In terms of the EYP, um, uh, Look, I mean, yeah, for me, it's, it's been a more distant. I, I, I quit EYP in 2004, but I still remain very close to, you know, several, uh, several generations which have followed afterwards and have been always supportive. Uh, I, I, I hire a lot of EYP from, uh, from uh, alumni as well from, for my company, uh, try to uh, help in any way possible, donate once in a while, and um, just believe that, that, that it's very important to stick and, and support. Um, and apparently it, it's kind of, um, you know, it all depends. Uh, I think we, we've been, I think, lucky. I, I don't know the situation kind of at the present moment, but, but, but still I can speak on... Uh, um, we, we, we were kind of lucky to uh, create a team, then kind of phase ourselves out, but still there was a string team, team there in the organization, which, which created another successive team, right, which followed afterwards. And it was kind of the responsibility of the leadership to make sure that you have someone to pass it to, so it carries on. And then, you know, sometimes we can get a glitch, sometimes there can be an issue. Sometimes we can get a president which, which is not involved or which kind of his priorities, her priorities have changed. And, and of course, it's kind of a difficulty. I didn't know how to solve this kind of issues. They happened, but it's very important that there is institutional memory within the organization, which is passed on from a generation to generation. And, and you know, you do have regular elections of the leadership. And of course, when needed, uh, that could be support from the central office. You know, a uh, you know, positive intervention or kind of a positive nudge, which could be given to any of the chapters in the countries which are, you know, experiencing difficulties uh, uh, for one way or another. I'm not sure if we answered uh, uh, Alan's uh, question that we tried. Very good. Thank you so much. Any other comments, questions um, from our audience? Right. Look, we we still have 15 minutes, so. Um, I actually have a question if I can jump in. Yes, of course. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so since the topic of our alumni talk today is civil society in Eastern Europe specifically, um, my question is sort of twofold. Uh, but the first part is, do you think that um, the focus of the objectives for the civil society in Eastern Europe is different um, to the focus on the objectives of Western Europe or anywhere else in the world? Or do you think those are uh, shared all around, let's say? And secondly, uh, kind of guessing that some of you might say that those are different. My second question would be, um, in that case, what do you think are the specificities or the specific areas of focus um, that are more predominant in Eastern uh, Europe civil societies compared to the counterparts in Western Europe. Wow. Do you have anyone who, who is your preferred candidate for answering this first? I don't think I have a preferred candidate. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> but I, I hope that wasn't uh, too long of a question and do no. tell I can mm. shorten yeah. it up. <laughs> No, this is a this is a challenging one. I did Basil, you want to have a go at this one? Yeah, first? Let, let me just start. Let me start, and then uh, maybe uh, Ania Hausab can can also contribute. Look, um, um, I mean, very thanks a lot for your question. I don't really see, uh, to be frank, a huge difference um, of the goals of the civil society in sort of like if you say Western Europe or or Eastern Europe. It just the number of issues that Eastern European countries, especially countries of the Soviet Union, have to deal with. Uh, they are um, uh, at a bigger scale, right? And therefore, uh, probably the role of the civil society is even more important because when you have a well-established society, well-functioning economy, you have free media, you don't have oligarchs, you have the rule of law, you have independent judiciary, it's kind of easy and it kind of functions um, um, uh, nice and properly, kind of you have fewer issues to deal well with. And then of course you can then 
focus on sustainability, you can focus on climate change, on issues which for less developed countries are kind of abstract, right? Uh, and uh, in a way, it's kind of clear why the climate change debate is you know, driven by the developed countries rather than you know, less developed because we have so many other issues we still we have to deal with. It's kind of difficult to have this abstract, uh, though it doesn't, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's not important, it's very important, but I, what I'm saying is that the issues we deal with uh, are kind of more, um, you know, uh, close to us, they're more tangible to us, right? Uh, because if your rights are violated in court and you know that the, the, the judge got a bribe uh, to rule against you, this is something that you can really feel. Uh, on a daily basis, can you feel the climate change? Maybe yes, maybe no. This is something, you know, you think this is not in your kind of daily needs. This is not what you feel on a daily basis here, right? Uh, or for instance, um, well, it could be there for some other examples. So, so in a way, and also I believe for the transformation and for driving reforms further, uh, the civil society is more important here than in the West. Therefore, uh, you know, I, I believe, uh, that in that in the post-Soviet countries, uh, you know, a vibrant society is instrumental for a democratic future. Right? We may have maybe a weaker state, but a stronger civil society. Whereas in the authoritarian countries next door, uh, they they have a stronger state, but a very weak civil society. You know, that's and we see the trajectory of how it's evolving, where it's where it's going. Yeah. Thanks, Cecil. Do we have other questions or anyone wants to add to this? Change. I think Vasya covered it well. Okay. Okay. Seb, you wanted to add something still to the to this last question about uh, this? I just I just wanted to clarify whether this was referring to the civil society's agenda or the country's agenda. Armina. Oh, I I meant yes, Seb John. I meant uh, for civil society agenda. For the civil society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're muted. You you muted yourself, Seb. You have to you have to unmute. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, sorry. I've I've got the the idea that the civil society issues range can be pretty much similar in all the countries to different uh, to different extent. You can fight for the um, for for the corruption in the Western Europe and in Eastern Europe, that the extent and the form of this corruption will be different. And the, the ways you fight and the ways you, you are engaged in the policy making to prevent those kind of practices will be different. Um, when it comes to the agenda of the countries, it, to a certain extent, it can, it can overlap. But in most of the cases, it will be different because when you look at, the, let's say, Europe, the European Union as such doesn't have the security issue at the border. All of our three countries has this. And in many ways, your future policy making and your future laws and your future perception is shaped based on this. I can bring you a very small example of, um, of the fact that Armenia has the, um, the, the, the conflict with Azerbaijan and a closed border with Azerbaijan at the moment. It has developed the agenda of teaching every kid, starting from eight years old, tech education, coding and engineering. This is done free, free of charge through two more creative technology centers where all the children learn this. Why did they do this? to invest in the future of the generation that is tech savvy, that can code, that can create in the, uh, in the circumstances of a closed border and can act and live and prosper when there is a closed border. And I think every country in, in our panel, Ukraine, Georgia, we come from the fact, from the constraint that we have. And obviously our agenda for the future might be in many ways different from the agenda of Western Europe where the Netherlands and Belgium has just a crossing road where they can cross through the, uh, to another country with a bicycle. Uh, since we start talking about it, actually, I, if I may add uh, briefly, I think uh, although you guys focus on differences, but there is a lot of similarities. And last years we've seen 
the same problems of the East, East become the problems of the West? I mean, will it be the rise of the populist? Will it be the Russia, Russian disinformation? And where I would disagree with Seb, I think the question of, uh, of uh, Russia uh, is the question for Europe as well, because it poses a threat to Europe as well. And we saw that with involvement in the elections, undermining of uh, democracy, supporting uh, fringe parties and so on. Besides Russian factor, of course, there are shared uh, causes for civil society. Will it be the LGBT rights? Will it be immigration even or extremism? You know, all, all these things, uh, you know, but like, of course, domestically, when it comes to democracy and the primary concerns that does not uh, exist in, in Western Europe. However, it has been lately also challenged. Yeah. Thank you, Anina. I, I mean, if I can, if I may add, I, I, I think that's, 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 that's important. And, and we've also had important events that have been, let's say, sh shaking some of these, what we believe for constitutional foundations almost, right? I mean, just take Brexit um, as one thing. Um, it's been shaking um, the European Union. Um, COVID has also sparked a lot of national reflex in, in the moment of uncertainty and, 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 and fear borders closed up quickly. The border between Ireland and, and Northern Ireland is, is something that is, things are still, are in dispute there. And, 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 and I think the, the risks of these um, conflicts also opening are ever more um, present. And of course, to some extent, maybe not still not comparable to the de degree of uncertainty or even outbreaks of violence that are de facto taking place in, in the, the past Soviet world. But I think still there's a greater um, sensitivity to, to that, to risk. And also, I think, to Russia's involvement, at least also in, 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 in Germany, I can also say that um, there's been a lot of surveillance now in recent elections because there was clarity that also Russia would try to get involved in, 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 in this with their means that Basile also explained around media. Um, okay, look, we got five minutes left. We may have time for one last question, if there is one, to our panel here, or comment to what was said. All right, good. Look, um, this is um, this has been a great evening. Um, credit goes to the UIP team actually for for bringing all of us here together. Um, I think it's wonderful that you're investing more work recently in bringing alumni together. I think this is really this is really a good move. I remember that I already had that on our agenda um, when I was more active and we did not manage. So it's really good that you're doing this now. It's important also for the sustainability. Um, Let's keep working together, um, keep borders open. I, I, I remember that for uh, Saul Patel, who is uh, one of the alumni who's very active actually bringing things together, Brexit was the moment that brought him back to EYP and he was one of the first, I think he was at, at the first or second or third EYP session, right? So talking about causes and purpose, um, it's still there. Um, it's it's there for all of us, and I think the EYP is a good is a good place to also to bring to bring us together. Um, thank you, therefore, EYP for doing this. Um, thank you, um, Ani Vasil uh, Hofsep for um, for joining me here tonight. I also learned a lot, um, and it, it it was great. Um, it was great to have this have this conversation, and also good to see many familiar faces in the in the audience also uh, really nice thanks to all of you for for joining um and for your very smart questions and comments really good we call it thank a night thank you thank you too. very much um, and have a wonderful night see you hopefully all very bye -bye. soon be safe bye. take care bye. thank you thanks, everyone bye 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 <clears throat> bye bye thank you so much everyone